Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining and welcome to the uh, Flex Room webinar covering the quarterly results. I'm delighted to have Mark Barnett, Chief Executive Officer with us here today. Uh, Mark will take you through some slides covering the quarter of activities and then we'll move on to Q&A. Um, and just a reminder to anyone who hasn't participated before uh, that you should see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can enter your questions. I'll now hand over to Mark. Thanks, Justin. You want to give it 30 seconds? I see people are still filing in. Okay, let's kick off. <clears throat> so I just want to give everyone a little bit of a, a background to start with, and then um, we'll dive into some of the more recent numbers. But broadly speaking, when, when we sort of think about who we are as a business, <clears throat> we're here to create a connected world for anyone on any device, anywhere, on any network, at any time. And that's really our sort of evolution as a business from we were predominantly a, a consumer travel data roaming business and with the network that we've built and the infrastructure that we've created, we made the decision last year to expand the business to be much more than just a, a consumer facing travel focused business to really move into that connected space, um, move into the IoT space and use the infrastructure and network that we've built to be able to connect any device anywhere for any reason. So the business model that we believe in and that we've set up, we believe is quite attractive and is what will sort of propel our business forward in the future. So we have a global network of partner and partners and customers. We're asset light. <clears throat> We're not a CapEx uh, heavy business. We're not investing in any, any physical infrastructure. We believe in, in um, revenue streams that are long-term and recurring. And so uh, you'll see that in many of our travel partnerships that we're doing, they're multi-year partnerships. And in all of our IoT business um, partnerships, we're really looking for those reoccurring revenue streams where we can implement our system, our infrastructure, and have reoccurring revenue that lasts for, in many cases, more than 10 years. And then we're part of the digital value chain, which means that we can wrap, uh, rapidly uh, scale with high cost efficiencies. Our core um, tech engine, we believe is a world-class tech engine. We have the infrastructure, we provide the embedded connectivity, we're multi-network, and so that we can work with many different types of customers on many different types of coverages, and we've got uh, agnostic uh, billing, and so we're highly customizable. We can build um, customizable subscription plans depending on who the customer is and cater towards their needs. We're an early adopter of the uh, eSIM technology, as you know. And so um, we are one of the nine worldwide Apple partners. <clears throat> um, no physical SIMs, faster connectivity. Um, and we believe that, um, and, and the data shows that global eSIM adoption will be 3.4 billion by 2025. So we're heavily um, invested in this space. We still provide physical SIMs because many of our customers don't, don't have um, phones or devices that use eSIM at this point, but we're trying to be ahead of the curve because we see that that's where everything is going. And so we're heavily invested uh, in this technology. So the two, the two main areas that we play in are the travel space and the IoT space, which for our businesses, we refer to them as FlexiRoam Travel and FlexiRoam Solutions. Um, the, the size and scale of those businesses uh, in some ways speak for themselves, but from a market um, uh, research forecast perspective, the global roaming markets expected to reach uh, almost $90 billion by 2027 and the IoT space, 1.6 trillion. And so the way we look at it is the spaces that we're playing in means that even a very, very, very small uh, market share in each of those place, uh, spaces creates a very valuable business from our perspective. And having our business set up to be able to service basically anything that sits under those umbrellas gives us a lot of opportunity with which way we want to go. 
So quick, quickly touching on the, the revenue models for both the, the travel and the solutions business, just to give you an idea. Um, one, one of the positives about the, the travel eSIM business is that it's upfront cash and fully digital. So, so from a consumer perspective, you can register, pay and have immediate connectivity no matter where you are in the world. And from our perspective, we collect the cash up front and the costs don't hit until the consumer start to use the data. And so what you'll see in a lot of our reports is that cash receipts and revenue don't necessarily match because the cash comes in, someone may buy a 12 month plan and then over the course of the 12 months, they use the data. When they use the data, we recognize the revenue and we incur the costs. And very similar in our IoT business, um, it's obviously paid for upfront usage comes later, but the, the payment model is a monthly recurring revenue model. And so the, the amount of data that's used in, in those transactions is very small. They're, they're fairly small micro transactions um, going backwards and forwards. And so we, we, we have a revenue model where we just get paid a monthly recurring subscription fee. And then in the case of MPOS, which is the, the area that we've moved into first, as our partners roll out more and more devices, that monthly revenue uh, increases. And once they roll out new devices and send those devices out into market, it's not the kind of thing where they regularly pull those devices back in um, and change connectivity partners. And so once we build those relationships and more and more devices get deployed into market, we see revenue grow. And once it grows, it doesn't, doesn't go back down. It, it grows and then and continues to stay for the life of the device. <clears throat> so that's sort of some background. Um, in terms of FY22, and, and just a reminder, FY22 for us runs from 1 April to 31 March next year. Um, I just want to share with you the priorities um, that, that we're focused on to position our business for long-term growth. And I moved into the role uh, at the towards the end of April, April 27, and sat down with the team and the board and worked through these priorities. And I believe in the priorities. It's obviously why I, I took the role and can see that as we move through this list and execute on this plan over the course of the year, we set, we set our business up for a long-term sustainable business. So the first of those is to enhance the infrastructure. We have a foundation and an infrastructure in place that is global with more than 580 partners across more than 150 countries. But it was, it was really important to me and the team that we invested in that infrastructure to make sure that we had the capability to scale to billions of devices. What we didn't want is to create a situation where we started to succeed as a business and grow the amount of customers we had, but not have an infrastructure to be able to cope with that volume of demand. And so a lot of what we've done in Q1 is to enhance that infrastructure and ensure that we have the capability to onboard the volume of devices that we need to in order to deliver the success that we're after. Number two is to build an experienced and diverse um, global leadership team. So you will have all seen that we appointed a chief revenue officer, uh, Yoast. He joins the business on the 1st of August. And so he's already started to get across things. We're really looking forward to having him join full time. And then you'll see during this quarter, we will appoint a chief technology officer and a chief operating officer, which will round out the leadership team. And in a couple of slides time, I can sort of show you what that leadership team looks like. We've established a presence and entity here in the UAE. And a big part of that was because A, we see that this is a, a growing market for us and a growing region. And B, in order to establish this global business, I wanted to position myself from a time zone perspective, somewhere where I can operate with Europe and the US and Southeast Asia and Australia. And so from a time zone perspective, it worked quite well. And then we're gonna build out a commercial leadership team under Yoast predominantly in Europe because that's where we can capitalize on the growing IoT demand. We're going to continue to focus on our eSIM solutions to capture that IoT explosion and build our corporate partnerships and close strategic deals because we obviously understand that, that we need some substantial revenue expansion to continue the growth of the business. So a quick snapshot of where we were versus where we're going. And I've touched on a little bit of this, so I won't, I won't repeat it all, but infrastructure is about being able to scale the team is about moving, moving the business from being predominantly a Southeast Asian focused and experienced business to a global experience team where we can capitalize on the, the infrastructure and the network that we have. Customer is, is we, we had what I would consider to be basic customer support resources. 
We're now moving into a world with 24 seven customer support across all time zones and multiple languages. And again, my view is if we're going to push this business into being a global business, we need to set up our support base to be able to support that. Um, IoT, I think we did a really good job as a business of picking a vertical, moving into that vertical and getting success. Again, that success was Southeast Asian focused success. The key for us now in IoT is to expand beyond MPOS and beyond Southeast Asia. And so what you'll see over the coming um, period, especially once we have Yost and his team on board, is that we'll expand into more verticals. And one of the questions we get often is, which vertical are you going to go into next? The honest answer is I don't know. We, we, we sort of see six, seven, eight, nine different verticals that we could go into. What I don't want to do is sit here and say, we're going into vertical A and all our resources go into A, where we ignore B, C, D, and E. And so at the moment, we are in conversations with multiple verticals. As we land one, we will then put more resources on it um, and then expand that, that vertical out like we did with MPOS. And then as we land another one, we'll do the same thing. But we didn't want to, to make that decision and only focus on one area when there may be more opportunities out there. And then from a channel perspective, you know, as a, as a very small business, we focused a lot on customer acquisition through resellers. And in some ways, that was positive because it helped the business grow. But in other ways, you're putting the future of the business in the hands of others. <clears throat> and so we'll continue to use resellers, but we now have multiple acquisition channels and a lot of those are more within our control. And we think that, and we believe that the, the outcome of where we're going is that we're our profitable, sustainable business. We are heavily focused on things like unit economics and long-term revenue, uh, recurring revenue, and the core focus of the business and what we're doing internally. Um, all, all points back to data and numbers. And so we're, we're establishing a team that is very disciplined when it comes to um, where we spend our money, how we spend our money, how those unit economics works and, and work and make sure that we have that flywheel where as we invest, there's more than what we invest coming back into the business. So as I touched on, P1 deliver, uh, P deliverables across Q1, the majority of that was the infrastructure. And it was a, it was a, um, a difficult decision for the team because what it meant was with a fairly small tech team, it meant committing to a plan that meant as particular commercial opportunities came up, we may have to leave them until Q2 because we want to finish the infrastructure work that we're doing. And so... You'll have seen that we launched a new corporate website, which can consolidates travel and solutions into a single platform, easier access for users. Uh, we launched the web shop, much better user experience for travel customers, easier access to data packs. We've introduced an affiliate and reseller program that's already bringing in additional revenue. Um, <clears throat> apps integration with travel booking partners, I'll touch on that shortly. Solutions portal system, so centralized account management, easy access for billing, ordering inventory, fulfillment, just a lot of the stuff that you always want to do but never have the time to do because a new opportunity comes up, so you run at that and you put it on the back burner. A new opportunity comes up, you run at that, you put it on the back burner. We made the decision that there was no more back burner. It was get the infrastructure um, in place, set the business up for the long-term sustainable growth, and the pleasing thing from my perspective is while we did that, we still managed to grow revenue. So we didn't have to stop one to do the other, but we didn't want to lose the focus on what we decided was the most important thing to do. Uh, leadership team um, I touched on. So obviously I joined uh, the board in February and then moved into the CEO role at the end of April. Uh, Jeff, um, the found, uh, founder of the business, um, is now moved into a new role as a chief innovation officer. Uh, Yoast joins us as our Chief Revenue Officer in August, and Lena continues to be our Chief Financial Officer. And then we'll hire a Chief Technology Officer and a Chief Operating Officer in Q2 and announce those fairly shortly. We're fairly close on both of those hires, so you should see announcements coming in the next probably two to six weeks um, for each of those two roles. And then that rounds out the, the leadership team that we believe takes us uh, to where we want to get to. Partnerships are uh, obviously critically important to us. And so I just want to call out a few of those key partnerships. Uh, so MasterCard is obviously a fairly large partner for us. Um, it's, it, the, the partnership has moved slower than we would have liked and slower than MasterCard would have liked, but that's predominantly due to COVID. 
So far, we have onboarded 11 banks with more than 100,000 potential users. There's 12 more banks to be onboarded across July and August with another 250,000 users. And so we're seeing that start to, to pick up in terms of speed. And we're in conversations with MasterCard about how we extend that partnership into uh, other regions. GHL uh, was announced this uh, in, in Q1. Um, really, really important partnership for us. And it, it validated the work that we had done in the MPOS space. <clears throat> um, we had already had an, an a agreement in place with them in Malaysia, and they had seen the benefits of what we could do where rather than having to do multiple deals with multiple telcos, they could work with us. And when they switched it on, it would pick up whichever telco had the, the strongest signal. They saw that as a really huge benefit. Um, when, when we talked to them about um, rolling out across Philippines and Thailand, again, they could see that um, they could basically ship devices to any of their markets with um, a flexi roam SIM in the device, and it didn't matter which market they were sending it to, the connectivity would work. And so they've managed to consolidate what was multiple partners across multiple markets into one partner for their entire their entire business. And so that rollout is ongoing. And every time they're, they're sending out a new device, we have exclusivity. And so that will continue to, to grow over time. <clears throat> revenue group similar. So rapidly expanding MPOS business, $14 million of revenue, they're looking to expand into Cambodia and Myanmar. They currently have 100,000 devices in Malaysia. The deal's only a couple of months old, and so far we've rolled out 6,000 devices. And so, again, it's small today, but it's small and growing and will continue to grow as more devices are deployed. And then uh, MYP1, very similar. So major payment industry provider across Malaysia and Southeast Asia, relationship across all Starbucks stores in Malaysia, 50,000 merchants today, 6,000 of them are ours. They're continuing to grow their business. And the more they grow their business, the more they roll out our, our devices. And so that's just a snapshot of some of the partnerships that we've got in place. Obviously, a lot more than that. Um, <clears throat> next slide is where we sort of, we, we've looked at different ways that we can integrate partners. <clears throat> and so this is for a couple of reasons. One, we created our FlexiRoam wallet. And in order to, there's a couple of different reasons. One, it allows us to um, hold more cash because people, we can, we can incentivize people to add in wallet credit. And so they top up their wallet credit, they then hold that credit in their wallet. And then when they're going to travel, they can then purchase a FlexiRoam data pack rather than having to take advantage of an offer today where they buy the pack, but they're not traveling for another six months. They can take up the offer and buy the wallet credits and use those credits in the future. We obviously want to increase the utility of the wallet and give people more reason to top up their wallet and more reasons and more options to spend that wallet credit on things beyond just FlexiRoam data. And so we have integrated Booking.com, Agoda, Kluke, and Kayak into our app. And so it's now possible to use FlexiRoam um, wallet credit to book hotels. Uh, the second phase of the integration, which will happen during Q2, will be to integrate FlexiRoam onto each of their sites so that when you are booking a hotel on one of those partner sites, you can add FlexiRoam on as an additional option and buy your travel roaming data at the same time. And so we just we're, there's just multiple different ways that we can work with partners and we're expanding that as much as possible as we go forward. So let's move into the, the financials. So <clears throat> there's... there's uh, through four, four financial slides, just want to take you through and, and again, give you a top line snapshot and have you take any questions at the end of that. But from an ending cash balance perspective, the cash balance is strong, 2.2 million. Um, burn rate at the moment is about 200,000 a month. We think there's um, very effective management of those expenses. And you'll see at the table at the bottom that offer operating cash flows, <clears throat> excluding the infrastructure, are down 40% compared to last year. And so We've got a fairly tight hold on our expenses. Um, the expenses uh, into infrastructure, we think they're important because they're really about um, setting the business up to scale, but on any of the costs that are not um, linked to you know, specific long-term growth, we, we have those costs very much under control at the moment, and we'll continue to do that moving forward. Uh, from a revenue and cash receipts perspective, you'll see that revenue growth year on year is up uh, 400%. 
and up 70% from last quarter. Um, as I said, one of the most pleasing things for me on the revenue growth in Q1 was that we managed to complete the infrastructure work without it being at the expense of revenue or cash receipts. And so the world is starting to open back up. I know um, in Australia, it's, it's fairly locked down at the moment, but what we're seeing is that as borders reopen across uh, Europe and the Middle East in particular, our revenue is, is increasing. And we're seeing, we're seeing that flow from um, new subscribers into people topping up their wallet, into people purchasing, and then the data utilization is, is the lag because sometimes you know, you're purchasing a couple of months prior to the travel. So we're seeing, we're seeing that data utilization start to increase now as the travel starting to happen where the revenue had come in a couple of months ago. Sorry, the cash receipts had come in a couple of months ago. Uh, so from a, a digital marketing perspective, we, we see digital marketing as a, as a key part of our future and, and see it as a, a huge opportunity for us to grow this business. What you'll see in the top graph is marketing and selling costs. The marketing component in that is fairly small. The majority of, of those are selling costs. And so selling costs for us are um, commissions to resellers or partners, or when we do uh, and have done in the past, data promos of sort of buy one and get one free. And so <clears throat> what we're really trying to see is that yellow line go down and sit from a budget perspective, we sit at about 30%. And so marketing costs in that are quite small. We're still, we're still learning a lot about our digital marketing capabilities. And you'll see down the bottom, we've gone over the last couple of months, we've gone from a cost of about $2 per install. So the amount of marketing that we spend to drive an install was $2 per install. We're now down to about 40 cents. And I think, I think um, what you'll see in Q2, it's in the, the mid to high 30 cents now. And over that period, we've gone from driving 140 installs um, a day up to 2,000 installs in, in, on some days. And so we're, we're, we're learning and optimizing a lot about our digital marketing capabilities and we're improving the funnel from where we get people to install. Those installs lead to subscribers. The subscribers then lead to people who um, start to consume either the free data that, that, that um, they may have taken up and then move into being a paying user from there. And so we sort of look at that funnel as um, getting people to install is the first step of the funnel. So key metrics. Um, I, I don't think we have shared this level of detail before. I really wanted to, to bring shareholders along on the journey with us and share how we're thinking about these numbers. So I touched on it before. So I just want to be really clear on the, on the definition of some of these. So a new subscriber for us is exactly that. It's a, it's a new, new subscriber who has signed up um, to FlexiRome, and they may or may not ever actually use any data. They may or may not ever pay. A subscriber is literally someone who has subscribed. After you've subscribed, you then move into either being an active user or a paying user. So active user is someone who consumes data. And so active users are somewhat low because the world is locked down at the moment, but active users um, could be either paying users or non-paying users. A non-paying user is someone who's either got a certain amount of free data or a MasterCard user could be an active user, but they're not a paying user if they've got a certain amount from the MasterCard allocation. And so we, we see active users will grow as the world opens back up and there's more travel. What's pleasing is that we're seeing big growth in paying users. And so that funnel, as we, we look at the funnel and there's a lot more metrics, I can tell you there's, there's 30, 40 pages of these different metrics and data that we look at to be able to see how things come together, but we're seeing the paying users increase and that, that is the sign of retention and the fact that you sort of move through that funnel into where we want people to be. We're seeing our ARPU increase. So um, it's up 12% year on year and we're sort of holding in that $50 range um, over the last few quarters. We're seeing eSIM activation go up. And again, um, in a lot of the markets that we operate in, they don't have um, eSIM enabled phones. And so it's not something that we have the control of driving. That's as, as um, newer phones get into the hands of our consumers, we'll see eSIM um, activations increase. But again, that's just a positive indicator for us that we're in the right space and they want that to continue to grow. And then from a wallet credit perspective, we're seeing every quarter more users using the wallet and more total credit balance sitting in the wallet. And so again, that's a lead indicator for us that there is 
a big chunk of money sitting in that wallet. People obviously plan to use it because they wouldn't top it up otherwise. And that's sitting there. When they use it, that converts into revenue. And those users then convert into active users and paying users. So we see a fairly strong funnel sitting there um, from, a, from a future revenue and user perspective. So that's the end of the, the set presentation. Um, Justin, do you want to ask any of the questions that have been submitted? Absolutely. So uh, thanks, Mark. And uh, just a reminder to anyone that joined late um, that if you have any questions, enter them in the Q&A section and then I'll, I'll read them out to the group. Um, so firstly, a question for me. So Mark, you joined first as a director um, before moving into the CEO role. Um, what initially attracted you to the business and enticed you to, to, um, to work at the company and then take on the CEO business, uh, CEO role? Yes, Christian. Um, I had finished my last role and had spent uh, four or five months doing homework with my kids and was sort of thinking about what I wanted to do next and actually reached out to Jeff um, as a potential investor in the business. And we set up some time and started talking and the conversation just flowed really well and really quickly. And we, we basically got off that call and I sort of saw it as an opportunity to maybe come in and, and act as a mentor or an advisor. Um, Jeff was really excited about that. And so we started um, talking further about what that could look like. Very quickly, that sort of turned into, um, would you like to join the board and make it more formal? I said, yes, I would. Um, and so dived in and then I, I sort of joke and, and say I became that really annoying board member who turned up to the office every day and sat in every meeting and had a, a perspective and an opinion and a suggestion on everything. And then Jeff basically said, look, would you consider um, taking on the, the, the CEO job full time? And as we talked about it, it sort of just became, became um, the right fit where Jeff wanted to move into more of a, a um, innovation role. That's his passion. That's where he does his best work. Um, and I was looking for the next thing to do. And when I, when I evaluated the business, I sort of said, look, I think A, it's amazing that this business has managed to weather the worst conditions that could ever be possible for a consumer travel data roaming business when the entire world gets shut down. And the speed the business moved out to, um, to shore itself up the way the, the team looked after employees in a world where we were reducing the size of the workforce by sort of 70, 80%, <clears throat> it just made me sort of, I got to the point where I, where I very quickly said, that's the kind of business that I want to be a part of. The way they chose to treat people, um, how they rapidly reduced costs, made sure the business could survive and was sustainable in the worst possible conditions, revenue still didn't go to zero. So, and then you look at the opportunity, the, the size of the opportunity that is in front of us, the global nature of the business, how untapped it is that we have that level of infrastructure, but have predominantly focused only on Southeast Asia. I saw that it was a business that had immense opportunity, but also one that I could add a lot of value to. It, it fit my skill set. And um, I, I could see that there were a lot of changes and improvements that I could make really quickly to have a tangible impact. And so, again, it was a pretty short conversation. We, we, we jumped in fairly quickly and uh, so far, so good. Mm, excellent. And um, given the global nature of the business, how are you running the business globally? So um, basically, as soon as I took the job, the next thing was to um, pack up and relocate. And so I've relocated to Dubai. I'm based here now. Um, that has helped a lot with conversations in this part of the world. It's also helped, you know, given that we're recruiting a, um, we have recruited a chief revenue officer who's based in Europe. Our chief technology officer will also very likely be based in Europe. And so from a time zone perspective, being able to run the business from somewhere central where borders are open, I can travel if and when required. Um, I can get up early and do calls in Australia. I can easily connect with the team in, in um, Southeast Asia and then also work with what will be our new team um, based in, in Europe and or the US. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I've had a few questions come in via email. Um, the first one's on the MasterCard uh, partnership. So the question is, will MasterCard develop their own app with a, a FlexiRoam ECM enablement um, to improve connectivity on their side? Um, I, I don't know if they will or not. MasterCard are pretty happy to use our app at the moment. Um, 
the benefits that it brings uh, their customers, they, they can see. So far, that, that partnership is working really, really well. They're really positive. Um, we're happy to work with MasterCard on any potential bespoke requirements if and when they come up, but um, that hasn't been anything that, that they have raised or that we've discussed with them to date. Um, what, they're, what they're really focused on is getting more and more banks signed up so that they can roll, roll um, the FlexiRoam solution and the card that has FlexiRoam um, <clears throat> attached to it rolled out to as many banks as possible. As I said, that, got, that, that process on their end got slowed down with COVID, but it's now starting to accelerate. As we said before, the, there's 11 banks that are in the program, but another 12 being added um, in July and August. So it's really starting to ramp up. And then I think the next evolution of the partnership with MasterCard is to evolve beyond an Asia-Pacific relationship and evolve that partnership into, into more markets. Okay, um, the next one that we've had via email is um, in relation to the Malaysian impost market. Uh, so why wasn't the increase of 70% of the Malaysian impost market announced to the ASX? Um, look, we, we announced the uh, agreement with GHL, which was a, a pretty big milestone for us, and that makes up the largest portion of that percentage. And we, we see that as, as demonstrating that we're executing on our strategy and um, we leveraged that success to win some smaller contracts, which are as material to earnings in isolation. And so we can't unfortunately announce every single deal that we do because if it's not material enough, we, we obviously can't um, announce it. But the largest of those was GHO, which was announced. And then in the quarterly, we'll obviously wrap up anything that, that falls under that umbrella. And so I'd sort of see that, that this is that announcement of the 70%. Yeah, uh, we've had another one um, in relation to incentives. So what incentives are you and Yoast getting regarding equity? Um, so look, a package, um, our, our package is in place. It aligns us with shareholders. There is a, a large equity component to those packages and shareholders will get updated on all those terms once the AGM notice of meeting is released, which we expect to go out either later this week or early next week for an AGM around mid-August. And so that'll detail um, all of those, those um, incentives with relation to the package. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the last one we've had via email is, um, when do you think institutions or backers would be really interested in investing in FlexiRoam? Look, we, we appreciate the support from all shareholders, um, institutions or otherwise. We, we have a, uh, what I believe is a highly attractive growth strategy and believe that we'll attract interest further from new investors as we execute on that strategy. So we're sort of very early days um, in the execution of that. Um, where we, 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 we believe that Q1 is a great stepping stone and we hope that these results um, are seen in that light. And... As, as we continue to execute on that strategy and show that we are heading towards the, the outcome that we're looking for, we believe that, that that'll be something that's continually attractive to more and more shareholders down the road. Okay, we've had um, a few questions come in via the webinar. Um, a few of them are all in, um, uh, in relation to eSIM. The first one being, can you explain what eSIM is? Um, how's it different to a regular SIM card? Yeah, so um, regular SIMs, as you know, the piece of plastic, you pop it out, you put it into your phone and away it goes. And eSIM is you don't need the, the plastic at all. You can literally just use the, the um, eSIM technology that is embedded into the device and um, you can have multiple SIMs. So with, with an eSIM, there's no physical SIM whatsoever. There's multiple SIMs, you can switch between them. So I can have um, multiple SIMs for different countries. I can then have a FlexiRoam eSIM that I can use for data. And so that, that, that is the main difference. The main difference is that it's inbuilt into your phone and it doesn't require any physical plastic to be popped in and popped out every time you wanted to make a change. Okay, I think the next couple of questions on eSIM you've, you've touched on already in that response. Um, yeah. The next one that came through was in relation to, to Yoast. Um, did you find Yoast or did he find FlexRoom himself? Um, and they mentioned they watched a recent webinar that presented for Tata Communications and um, FlexRoom's solution would address some of the issues that he had um, addressed previously. 
Uh, we found him. So we ran a fairly uh, comprehensive process. There were about 15 um, candidates that we, we started with and then obviously narrowed down over multiple rounds. Um, he was, he was a, a front running candidate right from the start, given his background and experience. Um, spoke to, he spoke to a number of people in our business, um, put forward his sort of perspective on the future and how he sees things playing out over time and the role that, that he would play in that from a commercial perspective. And so um, I, I, I agree with the comment. I've, I've seen that webinar and um, he was really excited about the role that, that FlexiRo could play in addressing <clears throat> what he has seen and experienced over his time in the industry. And so he's really, really excited to dive in and, and um, currently has a lot of ideas as to, to where he's going to start and where, where we'll see revenue coming um, in the early stages. Great. Um, and the last question we've had uh, via the webinar is, uh, what do you see as the biggest barrier to market in your conversations with, with potential customers? So I'll, let me try and answer it two ways. So on the travel side of the business, um, the biggest barrier is the world opening back up. Um, one of the things that, that's really pleased me since I've been in the role, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of partners, both existing partners and potential partners. And every time I've pitched um, our, our services or a partnership, I'm yet to get the answer of no, that doesn't work for us. No, that's not the kind of service we're after. So people don't necessarily, you know, sign up on the spot and say, hand me the pen, I want to sign the contract. But everybody leans in and says, got it, I get what that is, I get how that works, I see how that would be useful. And that's from, you know, travel partnerships through to um, partnerships with uh, member-based sporting organisations to airlines to, to any number of different partnership um, conversations that we're in. And so the, the biggest barrier from a travel perspective is just the world opening up and people believing that the world will ret return to normal and that there will be enough volume of travel um, for a service like ours. In the solutions business, I think the biggest barrier is just time. Because they're, they're long-term um, partnerships and long-term conversations where in some cases you're embedding into devices where it will last for more than 10 years, um, the amount of time it takes is a little bit longer than a normal sales cycle. And then once you, you crack that sales cycle, you then have a long-term partnership to, to run with from there. And so we find that it takes a lot of testing and trialing to make sure that what we say our device does, it does. And once you pass those trials and tests, then you work, you work through a lot of, um, there's, there's usually long processes when it comes to, to the legals and the contract signing. And so the sales cycle itself is fairly long, but I'm yet to hit any barriers that say, you can't do what we need you to do. That service is not valuable to us or our customers. And so, it's pleasing that from a barrier perspective, they're certainly not insurmountable barriers. They're just time-based barriers. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, well, that's all the questions that we've had. Uh, so Mark, on behalf of everyone on the call, thank you very much for your time. Um, and if anyone has any further questions, uh, please be in contact with either Mark or myself. Awesome, thanks, Justin. Thanks for the support from, uh, from all the shareholders. Happy to to continue to do these and share the progress of the business um, as, as we continue down this journey together. So thank you.